Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do chapter three now. <laughs> That's okay. You can do your copy over there. You get the, you get special privileges just because you're this teacher's pet. Ooh. Um, so I hope that it made that made sense. Chapter two for you all. I mean, there is a qualification. You know, there is a there are those who Jesus will say, "I never knew you." It's a sad really sad commentary that there are going to be people before the white throne judgment and Jesus is going to say I never knew you uh, and uh, so you know, we need to make sure and I'm not saying we should question our own salvation I believe that once the spirit has given us that uh, confirmation we're good we're going to have times where we feel like worthless like Paul would say the least of the, of the saints or the chief of sinners, yeah, we're going to beat ourselves up, and that's okay to an extent. It's okay to beat ourselves up a little bit. It's all right to be um, be disciplined in our faith, but uh, be careful. Don't don't condemn yourself. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus in Romans chapter 8. Romans is a great book. It teaches us so much about who we are positionally in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, another great chapter concerning positional truth finished work um, but at the same time what James is trying to encourage them as the as the book is encouraging us all to really live that faith to bear the fruits of the Spirit so much of the New Testament is not for most Christians believe it or not most Christians can't handle this truth the most of the New Testament is written only for disciples and you may look at it and say oh it's great stuff but only disciples live those words when you know when it talks about being uh, children of the light, there are many people who have a have a salvation in Christ, but they never have that that uh, active faith, and uh, it's sad. I'm not, but even that, there are people in churches who, at that time of the white, you know, they'll be think well, they won't even know about the bemisi probably, but they will see Christ at the white throne judgment, and they may have gone to church their entire lives. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Not that I knew you and forgot you, but that I never knew you. <clears throat> so um, that's what James is also speaking of here. He's being very blunt to say, you know, just saying you believe is not going to, that type of faith is not going to say. It has to be a believe in your heart to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. So here we are in chapter 3, the tongue chapter. This is a bad, you know, and oh, we hate this chapter. Don't preach on this, Pastor. Because I don't like it either. Because I don't, I'm not a very soft person. I'm not, you know, I'm not that touchy-feely, pat you on the head, you know, tell you all nice things. I'll pretty much tell you the way it is. And, you know, if you like it, you do. And if you don't, well, and get another counseling. But um, I tend to be pretty matter-of-fact. But in verse 1, it says, Do not be many masters, actually teachers. The word is uh, didaskalos. It's used uh, 41 times in <laughs> reference to Jesus. It means uh, a teacher. Uh, so, be not many teachers, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. <clears throat> Isn't that a positive verse for all of you people aspiring to be pastors? Uh, that word is not a good translation either. If you have condemnation in your Bible, the word actually better translated is judgment more scrutiny even um, great example is Moses all Moses did was hit a rock that's all he did he hit a rock twice and God says you're not going into the kingdom you're not going into the promised land because in, in fact why don't we uh, turn there it's in Numbers chapter 20 in verse 12 And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. That's pretty severe. But Moses was the leader. He was the guy who would be up on Mount Sinai for 40 days getting the law. He's the guy that met uh, God in the tent uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. He was the one that saw the glory of the Lord. 
He was the man. And he, he did not honor God before the congregation. He got angry. I mean, if you read through what happened, he actually yelled at the people and smacked the rock. He wasn't supposed to. He was only supposed to speak to the rock. But, you know, and, you know when we look at how big, how big is our mess, you know, if, uh, if somebody does something foolish or, you know, or, or falls or fails in a, in a way, they make a mess. And that mess can encompass their family, it can encompass their friends. What about when a pastor makes a mess? Mm. You know, it can affect the congregation, it can affect an affiliation, it can do a lot of damage. It can be on the nightly news, you know, look at all of this garbage that you hear about on the nightly news. And they would love to put on the top story tonight as a failure of a pastor or a preacher or a, or a priest or any person who is in any type of religious authority. Um, so there is uh, a definite difference if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be a pastor, uh, that you do have to be very careful and you have to limit yourself. You really do have to remove yourself from many areas that other people can go into without any problem. You have to be very, so he's saying that, that you have to, uh, you will receive a greater judgment. In Ezekiel, there's a passage concerning teaching. And in this day and age, when people don't want to hear sound doctrine, they would much rather hear something that tickles their ears. Um, we have to stay true, even though it's going to cost you people in your church. And your church is going to, you're going to offend people, and people are going to leave. But in um, chapter 3 of Ezekiel, he talks about the watchman. Verse 18, he says, When I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him not warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. That is it's some powerful stuff. And that is to every pastor and every pulpit that we have to teach the hard sayings. We're, you're going to have to come to church some Sundays and the pastor is going to beat you up. And you have to take it. You have to say, thank you, pastor. May I have another? Well, maybe not that, but you'd have to say, thank you, pastor. Because he's doing it for your soul's sake. Mm. He has to warn the congregation. Mm. He loves you. And he wants you to grow in holiness and in righteousness. So don't be, don't complain, oh, pastor, what did, who told, who called you and told you what I would, you know. <laughs> no, nobody called him. He just, he just preaches what he's given by the Spirit and what he studies. Every, I mean, I know for myself. I pray as I study on Sunday mornings that God would give me the message for the congregation. Because I don't know what's happening in every single person's life. How could I? I you know, and, you, and you can't uh, overstep their free volition. But the Spirit will impart a message to the, to the pastor. And the pastor will deliver that message. He has to. Because there, it's, it's a very uh, important verse. Pastor uh, Stevens has preached on it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for it is unprofitable to you. If a pastor refuses to preach the whole counsel of God and doesn't bring the hard sayings when it's necessary, he will stand before the Lord. And if a person dies in their sin... And he tells the Lord, I'm sorry, he never told me that. And Jesus looks at the pastor and says, he's right. You never spoke on that. And I'll tell you, and, and there is even, speaking as a pastor, there is that um, temptation to not go there. To say, you know, I probably shouldn't. You, you don't want to go to alcohol or adultery or you know whatever other sins of the nation or sins of the of the society um, you don't want to uh, stir that pot but you have to you have to do it and maybe your congregation won't be the thousands it won't even be the hundreds it'll be the dozens because you're preaching a cross you're mm -hmm. preaching conviction you're preaching the whole counsel of God 
people aren't going to want to hear it. They have the itching ears. And it says in the latter times, they will be drawing to them teachers that, you know, who have cunningly devised fables, but they're actually doctrines of devils. Um, so we love the grace message. We love the finished work message. But at the same time, we got to hear it. We got to hear it all. We got to hear Jesus say, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Right? I mean, that wasn't a very nice thing to say to one of his inner circles. Right? James, John, and Peter were like the three big guys. And here Jesus is saying in Matthew 16, get behind me, Satan. What's with that? Hello, Jesus. You know, I just told you you were the Christ. And now you're telling me I'm Satan? You know. But Peter stayed on. Peter was a good, good egg. So... So that's why it says here, not to be many teachers. And if you are going to be a teacher, if God has called you to pastor it, don't refuse that call. I mean, if he if he has genuinely called, please don't do it for the money. Greater <laughs> Grace World Outreach, you don't do it for the money anyway. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be buying my wife a Lamborghini anytime soon. <laughs> so, uh, but. Uh, but be careful. This, if, if God has called you to the pastorate, then obey that call. Don't be foolish and say, oh, I can't do it. Hey, okay. you know. I would rather do, I would rather do God's will, um, you know, with fear and trembling and a feeling of inadequacy than not do his will and watch my light burn up at the, at the Bema seat someday. He says in verse 2, For in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, that's teleos, a mature man, able also to bridle his whole body. Now over and over again, <clears throat> there, is, uh, there is this, uh, especially in Proverbs, many, many verses concerning the tongue. Now this word offense, though, is interesting because it's not the word that you normally see for offense. That's skandalizo. Uh, this word is different. It's only it only appears four times in the New Testament, and it has a different connotation than than actually to offend. It means to stumble in our duty, or to to, and this is why it's kind of related to verse one. It says to be as we are teachers, we don't want to be negligent in our duty, and what that speaks of is offense by a. Offending in this particular verse, the word is, uh, sorry, I didn't write down the word. Okay, I don't have the Greek word, but it's not skandalizo, which is the one that occurs over 30 times in the New Testament. It's a different word that only occurs four times. And it's also in James chapter 2, verse 10. It means to fail in our duty. And that's really what I was speaking of. A person who is teaching but is not performing the duty God has called him to, he is offending many. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it does give a better, I like that definition there because we all offend. I mean, in some things we offend all, but really when we offend by not doing what we're called to do, that's, that's a, you know, that mm -hmm. is really grievous. And then it talks about horses and ships in verses three and four. Um, horses speaking of obedience. I mean, uh, horses are beautiful, majestic animals, but somehow we can make them go where we want them to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, horses, I, I just, you know, I believe they're God's greatest creation. Um, but you put a, a bridle or a bit in their mouth, and next thing you know, you can actually turn their heads, you can turn their entire bodies, and you can have them go where you want. So it speaks of control, and it speaks of obedience. That, um, and also, in the, the ship... As it says here in verse um, mm -hmm. 4, they are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned with a very small helm. So we see, you know, in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about being tossed about by every wind of doctrine. In chapter 1 of James, it talks about um, he that, wa that uh, wavers in his faith is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's speaking of obedience and then steadfastness. And the tongue is something that can destroy those things. Such an easy, you know, such a small thing, but it can destroy, mm -hmm. um, a, it can destroy a good conversation. It can destroy a good care, uh, testimony mm -hmm. very quickly. The sins of the tongue, or even the idle words, 
Every idle word we're going to have to give account for. It says that in the book of Matthew. So we need to be very careful. Let our words on earth be few. You know, and let the words that we do speak be the oracles of God. Let's make sure that when we speak, no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. But that which is edifying, that's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. First Peter 4, 11 is the speak the oracles of God. Because the tongue is really a, you know, can really be damaged. And now with this age of Twitter and emails and Facebook and all this other stuff, um, you know, I just saw recently a guy left the church, and what does he do? He goes on Facebook, and he's now berailing the, you know, the pastor of the church that he used to go to publicly. He's looking for people who will agree with him. Of course you're going to find some slime ball that's going to agree with you. You know, it's just just the way it is in this world. Um, but I just think why, you know, is God, does, did God give us Facebook for the purpose of, you know, ripping, uh, ripping the people we don't like? You know, I don't think so. I don't think God gave us Facebook at all. Facebook, God gives us. Facebook, God does not give us. The social media, you know, is, be careful with that. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot of garbage out there. Thankfully, I don't have a Facebook page, but I do still look at the one from the church in Albania because I still have the password for that one. But I get a lot of stuff from out from uh, that's in Albania that I can't understand. So. But uh, be careful. Uh, and um, the tongue—it doesn't have to actually be words we say; it can be words we print, right? Words that we've uh, used Twitter and what are the other ones? I don't even know. Anyway, you know what I mean. But I guess like the president is always getting in trouble for stuff. He he just loves to throw stuff on that Twitter thing, and you know. Anyway, people love to love to eat it up. So, in Ephesians chapter four, verse one, um, it says that uh, we need to uh, walk worthy of our calling. Right? I, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the location wherein you are called. Um, so we have obedience and we have uh, instruction and we have the, the trials of life and how we go. Th you know, here's the thing. Uh, Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. And he doesn't, he can't read our thoughts. So consider this, that when we speak negatively or speak critically, what we are doing is we are feeding the atmosphere. We are giving Satan information he shouldn't have and he doesn't deserve. And he's going to use that information against us. Now, you know, people say, well, can Satan hear our prayers? I don't even care if he can hear my prayers or not. It doesn't matter. I'm going to pray anyway. And I know, you know, when it talks about the, the high priest who go into the holiest of all in the incense altar, I don't know. I mean, there's really, I, I can't think of a verse that, gives us any definition, maybe there is, maybe if you know one, you can shout it out or whatever. Um, but that's not what I'm talking, what I'm saying is that when we speak negative, when we speak critical, when we are, when we are beating people up, and we are, uh, you know, doing, uh, really, when we are trampling the, the blood of Christ in our conversations, Satan is listening, and he is writing it down, and he's going to use it against us. Why should we give him any more weapons than he has already? He is not, he doesn't know our thoughts. So how we react. So when we see here the horse in the ship, we see the obedience and we see the storms. How do we react in the storms? Are we, are we critical? Are we um, cursing God? Are we like, you know, like Lot's, uh, Job's wife said he should do? Just curse God and die. You know, are we doing, are we like, Jonah in the bit, you know, the bottom of the ship. <clears throat> Are we giving this the enemy weapons against us with our words? Are we in our disobedience? Are we, you know, what it, as it even says in James here, um, verse nine. Wherefore bless we God, even the Father, where when we curse men which are made at the similitude of God. Mm -hmm. All through this passage, he's saying, what you're doing is you're helping Satan in his work. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. As a fountain set forth 
at the same place sweet, water, and bitter. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, I heard messages on what, what Satan watches. He watches our countenance, our conversation, and our conduct. Those the three C's of Satan. Um, and he hears our conversations. Even if it's just alone in the room when we're cursing a situation, you know, or we're, or we're speaking evil of a brother or a sister, Satan's eating it up. He loves this stuff. And, he's and, he's, and James is saying, look what you're doing. It's, there is a spiritual warfare here. It's not just flesh and blood, as we see in Ephesians 6. Our warfare is not flesh and blood. So if we are throwing out into the atmosphere all of our vile opinions and negative speech, whew, Satan is just going to use it and run with it. Um, in Isaiah, it talks about, well, um, oh, I don't even know if I can find it, 20, 20, uh, talks about cockatrice eggs. Do you know what that is? Okay. I thought it was in the 20-something, but I'm probably wrong. <coughs> you want to have a concordance? I don't know how to spell cockatrice. <laughs> but if you do, it probably is only two or three verses that have that word in it. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, um, it's right at the beginning of the chapter. I thought it was in like chapter 28 or something. Um, I don't want to spend too much time looking for it, so if somebody can find it for me, I'd appreciate it. 59.5? Huh? 59.5? Oh, I knew I was close. <laughs> right, okay. I was in the right testament. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 59, <clears throat> verse um, 4. None calls for justice, nor any pleads for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eats of their eggs dies, and that which is crushed breaks out in a viper. Now that's a pretty self-explanatory verse, so we're not going to talk a lot about it. But uh, just for those of you who are saying, what is he talking about? Um, now imagine I say something bad about Josh because you don't know Josh. Josh, where's your hand, Josh? Okay, he doesn't actually live in this state. He lives in Maryland. He's going to Bible college. What if I said something bad about him? What if I said something bad about something he did or something you know in his past? But you don't really know this guy. But I've just put something in your head. I've just laid an egg in your head. Now he goes to Maryland, and you don't think anything of it. But five years from now, he comes back. The only memory you have of him is the bad thing I said about him. And it's still in your head. It's a bad thing about memories is that they stay there. And if it's a bad memory or if it's something evil, if it's an evil report that someone has said about someone, you'll remember it. Even if you don't want to. It's hard to take these memories out. This is what it's saying. Evil reports that we give out just as a, as a matter of information, at, you know, in confidence with our friends at Panera Bread, that's evil. It's evil. Be careful. Because Satan would love to use it. And he would love to plant an, a spider's egg in your head. How's that for a cockatrice egg, which is a, a, a snake, a viper? And that's what James is saying here. Be careful. You have no idea. It's not an idle word when it hits the atmosphere. Remember, we are dealing with spiritual warfare. We don't think about it. We're not. We don't. You know, we're not looking around at the demons in the room. Um, but uh, there is always the possibility that something we say can be used. You know, as they say, used against us in the court of spiritual warfare. <clears throat> so be very careful. Let your words utter. Proverbs speaks so much about um, Matthew five thirty seven. Let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. Um, in uh, Proverbs 21, verse uh, 23. Yeah, with your fingers. Hmm. Whoso keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. So, and there's many others. I think there's another one in Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 11. A 
foolish utters all his mind, but a wise man keeps it in till afterwards. And there's another one that in Ecclesiastes. Um, and this is speaking again of teachers. Verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So does a little folly of him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. <coughs> The Bible's got a lot of these types of verses in it. We don't want to shy away from them. We want to read the book of Proverbs. And we want to really be blessed by its instruction. We want to read the book of James and be exhorted to live holy. I mean, it's, it's profitable. It's profitable for us for, to have the life of peace and joy that God wants us to have. There are some gives and takes. There are some things in our lives that have to be let loose. <clears throat> and there are other things that have to be augmented and and developed. So, back in this uh, passage here, he goes on in verses 13 through 17 to speak of the difference between wisdom from above and wisdom from beneath. In 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, it talks a lot about the earthly wisdom. <coughs> um, here also. I mean, in this world is full of, it's not so much wisdom as it is knowledge. Knowledge will increase, it says in Daniel 12, I think it's verse uh, 3, 3 or 4, uh, that in the end times, that knowledge will increase. And we know that knowledge is increasing. 150 years ago, we were still riding horses and carts and buggies and things, right? Now, here we are in the 21st century, and we all have our own little, uh, you know, remember Dick Tracy? You know? <laughs> Dick Tracy is like ancient history now. And that guy had some cool toys. Now we all have better toys than Dick. Um, so, you know, wisdom from beneath uh, and wisdom from above. And it's very clear how he writes on this one. Verse 13, he starts off qualifying it with the tongue also. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So he's speaking in that one verse about faith works and about uh, being careful with our tongues. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 2, we already spoke a little bit about um, the vocation where we are called. In verse 2 of Ephesians 4, um, it's also a parallel verse. Where it says, uh, With all lowliness and meekening, meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. A good conversation, edification. Ephesians 4.29 again. Words that, you know, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is edifying and gives grace to the hearer. Um, words of encouragement. People actually, there are some who have a gift of encouragement. I know a good friend of mine, he's not in the church currently, he'll be back, um, had a great gift of encouragement. Everybody is called to encourage, but this guy was something special. And uh, well, no matter what, he could, he could just say something and it just like, like the sun would come out. We all have our gifts, and but uh, some are, some are, you know, I, I love seeing the gifts of, of the Spirit in people's lives. So, verse uh, 14, if there's bitter envy and strife in your hearts, do not glory and lie against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, it is earthly, which means it has this life in view, it is temporally viewed, everything is about me and about this life, it's not eternal, if it is earthly. It is sensual. That word is suki, uh, suki, sukiki. No, it's 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 p s u c h i k e e. It's a derivative of suki, where suke, which is the soul, and it's soulish. I mean, it's self gratifying. So, earthly means it only looks at the temporal. It only looks at the things we can see by sight. Sensual means it is self centered. It is in the emotions. It is self-gratifying. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It's talk, it's, that word is translated natural. The natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. And then lastly, it's devilish. It's demonic. It, is anti, it stands opposed to God and God's will. So the wisdom from beneath is self-centered. It is sensual. It is self-gratifying. It is Temporal, it is all about me and my life, and it is demonic. 
just, you know, even it says about the tongue, it said that the tongue is ignited by the fires of hell in verse 6. And now here, wisdom is also, it's all, you know, it's, he's talking about spiritual warfare. <clears throat> Don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. However, verse 17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and that's the word uh, derived from hagios, which means holy, set apart. Wisdom from above. I love the fact that there's, you know, when we talk about hagios, the word in the Greek for holy, it also means separated. Because there is a separation that must happen for holiness. There has to be a removing of our thoughts and our desires away from the things of this earth into the things of God. And we need to separate ourselves and say that we are no longer part of that system. We are, not, we are strangers and pilgrims, as we talked about in the book of Hebrews. We have to maintain that mentality and have a separated life, a pure life, a holy life. They desire that holiness. Peaceable. It means that they love peace. We saw that also in uh, um, Hebrews. Those who love peace. Gentle. Ep epiikes. This is a great favorite word of Pastor Stevens. Philippians chapter 4 verse 5. It says, let your moderation be known unto men. Speaking of our gentleness. In Psalm 18 verse 35. He says, your gentleness has made me great. Do not be very quick to be opinionated or to be argumentative, but to be gentle. Easily entreated, which means reasonable, not obstinate. Merciful, meaning compassionate, forgiving, and kind. And fruitful, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. That, uh, and that's, we'll look at that progression. And that's a great progression in 2 Peter chapter 1. And it ends with how you will not be unfruitful. John chapter 15, verse 8, speaks of bearing fruit as we abide in him. We, we bear fruit when we have the wisdom that's from above. And then it says impartial. This word is uh, a diakritos. Diakritos means discerning or judgmental. Ah, the A prefix means without judging, to be impartial, to be fair. <clears throat> not a respecter of persons. And then the last thing, without hypocrisy, not, not hypocritical, but sincere and real. So these, these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things, these eight fruits of wisdom that is from above will be on a test, not with their definitions, just their words, just so you'll be able to just think about uh, these types of um, fruits of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see that in Proverbs 9.10. Mm -hmm. um, and it is important that we have a godly reverence for the Lord, that we separate ourselves from this world, that we have our, our, you know, make sure that the things we say and even the things we think are edifying. You know, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. Right? The words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. Where is that? That in Psalm, Psalm 18? 1914. Also? I was just looking at 1914. that. 1914. That's insane. <laughs> right? Let the, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Because our tongue, it's unruly. And it says in this passage, you can't even tame it. <laughs> I find that remarkable. Where is that? Um, verse 7. Every kind of beast and of birds and serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. He doesn't give the solution. His only solution really is to keep it closed. <laughs> you can't tame that thing. It's an unruly. And it says right there in verse 6, um, it sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Um, so, don't be many teachers, because the messes you make are big messes. No. But, but if God calls you to be a teacher, be a teacher, please. We need teachers. We need pastors. We need missionaries. We need evangelists. The world is a terrible place, and it needs a bunch of people out there shining a little bit of light. Don't put your light under a bushel. Get it out there. Be foolish. Be ridiculous. Be a laughing stock. It's fun. <laughs> yes. Can the uh, 
Can the tongue also be used as like a a condition of, of which heart that I am operating in? Like if I'm not operating in in my new heart, like of course it's going to be used to, you know, bear destruction. But if I'm like operating in in my new heart, obviously it's going to be used for God. Well, I think that I think what he says is let your knees be a your knees be a more than that leads to evil. I think is the way the rest of that verse goes. Mm -hmm. um, it is just good to have a quiet spirit and to and to and to purpose to edify. You know, hold back and then and then speak the words that build up. Um, so. We're going to end this class maybe a little bit early, but um, the last verse of this chapter is really great. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We see that also in Philippians 1 11, Hebrews 12 11. It is sown in peace of them that make peace. Um, so that's a great, and so he starts off the chapter really with, you know, the questioning, you know, somewhere in the middle here, when he's questioning faith, what is faith? It's not self-serving. It's not wisdom from a, from beneath. It's not having many things to say. It is a meek spirit. It is one who is seeking peace. It is one who is desiring to have the wisdom from above, who actually have an active faith, an active trust in God. And, um, and this is what Christ is looking for. It's, he's looking for us to to have a strong faith like Abraham had and use it, you know. And then in chapter 3 we see, be careful about our own conduct in life. Be careful about the words we say. Be careful about the wisdom that we think we have. Make sure that if it doesn't fall into these eight categories, then maybe it's not. If it is self-centered, if it is seeking our own gratification, or if it is against God's will for our lives, then it's not wisdom. And you hear it. I mean, I, I think I mentioned it last week. You hear people talk about, oh, God spoke to me. God told me this. God told me that. And I think to myself, you know what? That's not the same God I'm worshiping. If God told you that, then God isn't all that wise. But you have to be careful because you can't violate a person's free will. You know, when people use those phrases, well, God told me. God spoke to me. God showed me. Well, be careful. Let's, let's, let's analyze that according to the wisdom that's from above. And let's analyze it according to the wisdom that's from beneath. Mm -hmm. And let's see where it lines up, you know, and then go through it. Oftentimes as a pastor, if somebody tells me, well, God spoke to me, I'm like, well, what am I going to tell you? If God spoke to you, why are you coming to me? Mm -hmm. God's bigger than I am. I'm just some idiot. You know, if you've got words from God, but, you know. All too often, they're not words from God at all. They're words from they're words from our flesh, and they're words that appease our earthly uh, desires. So, be careful and be willing to forego our will and to say, you know what? It sounds good. It looks good, but it's not good. You know, God is good, and even though you know, even though like God did with. Uh, Abram and Lot. Abram said to Lot, hey, you, you choose. Go anywhere you want. You go right, I'll go left. And Lot saw by sight the plains of Sodom. And he said, that's where I want to go. Mm -hmm. That was not a good choice, was it? Mm -hmm. And he took all of his stuff. I said it actually to the teens also Sunday. It says that Lot had cattle and flocks and tents. Right? So he had he had cows and sheep in tents, and he was rich, and he had many servants. But where did the angel find him? Found him living in a house in the middle of a city. What happened to everything he had? What happened to his flocks, and his tents, and his servants, and his riches? Gone. He's living in the city. And they got to bang down his door to get him out of the city. Right? So the things that we think look great by sight, oftentimes, lead us to destruction. So... Always use the spirit's um, weight system, you know, his balances, and make sure if it's wise, then we, then it will line up well with the word of God.
if it's a, if it's wisdom from beneath, then just say, okay, it's not not for me because I'm going to live according to the fruits of the spirit. Okay, so we'll amen that. And next week, if you want to read ahead, read verse chapters four and five, and we'll finish up the Lord of James next week. Is there a class next week? Oh no, okay, we can cut that up.